morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. We're going to be getting started, so find your seats, finish up your conversations, settle in. Uh, we've got a great day ahead. Wow, you guys are a great audience. This is great. Hi, my name is Pat Hayes, and I'm the uh, volunteer site steward at Orland Grassland, which is a um, Forest Preserves of Cook County site, uh, way down in the southwest corner of Cook County. Um, hello, welcome. Let's turn our cell phones off, right, rule number one, and let's get started. I want to acknowledge all of you here. Um, the history of wild things goes way back, decades, before Betts, before Schulenberg, in some form or another. You are the largest audience that this conference has ever had. So give yourself a hand. We've come a long way. How many here are here for the first time? Cla oh, wow, look at that. Whoa, that's terrific. And how many here are volunteers? Wonderful, that's wonderful. As uh, watch the screen, you may see your photo up here. This is all about volunteering and the wonderful things that volunteers accomplish. Let's get on with a little housekeeping. Um, number one, use the map. There's a lot of people here you're going to have to be navigating around. Use your map to plan your way. To get to the tower, rooms that are numbered from the student center east, that's where we are now. You must go up to the second floor via the stairs or the elevator, cross over the pedway. To get to the lecture rooms, go outside of Student Center East, over on the west side, from the ground floor. Underneath um, the big orange banner. So walk underneath the big orange banner, and then it's the door on your left. The larger lecture rooms were added to the venue. As you know, we got an, an unusually large crowd. They were added at the last minute. Um, and, but if you still find that your room is too crowded for your session, there are wonderful other uh, sessions for you to just drop into. So feel free to do that. Feel free to stand in the back of the room, as many people are here, uh, whatever your comfort level is. Um, in the program, the large rooms are bolded, so you could you know, get your eyes on a large room right away and know right where to go if you wanted to. Pay attention. Sometimes there are only 10 minutes that are allowed for passing in the afternoon between the sessions, all right? There are exhibitors and vendors. There's a lot to take in during your hour and a half lunch. You all got your tags and there's dots on them, all right? Green means that you are in lunch session one and yellow means that you are in lunch session two. So we could string it out a little bit. Not everybody's in line at the same time. Um, there's the exhibitors and vendors. Uh, wait till the line dies down, but they've already done this segmenting of the lunch session, so that should be very helpful. Pay attention. The first breakout session in the afternoon starts at 1.30. In your program book, it says your lunch the lunch session ends at 1.30. So you're going to have to leave before 1.30 to get to your session that begins at 1.30. So pay attention to that. Um, volunteers in Wild Things t-shirts are here to help you. So, you know, if you see somebody wandering around in a Wild Things t-shirt, uh, they're, they're here to help. Um, there are a couple people wandering around taking photos for us. We want some photos for next year's conference to everybody can see how much fun we had. So tell them if you don't want your picture taken, okay? They're going to be snapping pictures. Think, um, I want to just take a minute. All these wonderful people are here because of a lot of hard work of people who volunteered to put it together. This is a volunteer conference by volunteers for volunteers. Um, I'm not going to name all the people that are in your program, but know that there were great efforts made for this day to happen. Um, okay. <laughs> Another thing that we really, really need um, are sponsors, and we have we had many generous sponsors. Um, I'd like to thank and name our wildest sponsors. That would be the Boeing Company, the Chicago Park District, the Forest Preserves of Cook County, the Nature Conservancy. 
Open Lands, Woods and Prairie Foundation. So let's give those people a hand. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to our um, first guest here today. Tony Preckwinkle has been a dedicated community leader for over two decades. She currently serves as board president of both Cook County and the Forest Preserves of Cook County. Before being elected board president, Preckwinkle served 19 years as alderman of the Forest Ward. Prior to that, she taught high school students history for 10 years. She holds a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from the University of Chicago. As president of the Forest Preserves of Cook County, President Preckwinkle has taken major steps to increase professionalism, efficiency, and effectiveness. She increased focus on restoring natural areas and on strategic planning for restoration, camping, recreation, and trails. As part of the Forest Preserve Centennial, she commissioned the ambitious Next Century Conservation Plan. That includes bringing new and diverse audiences to the preserves, increasing the holdings to 90,000 acres, and restoring 30,000 acres to high quality woods, prairies, and wetlands over the next 25 years. President Preckwinkle, thank you so much for kicking off this conservation conference. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. I'm very pleased to be here. I want to thank you, Pat, for that kind introduction. And I want to welcome you to the sixth annual Wild Things Conference. So I'm a history teacher, and I figure anything that goes on for a decade or more is pretty substantive. So I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here today, and I look forward to coming again uh, at this biannual event. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the good work before I begin of Arnold Randall and all of our Forest Preserve staff, some of whom are here today. Arnold, do you want to stand up? Thank you. So some of you know that the Forest Preserves are celebrating their 100th anniversary. And we had a next century conservation plan uh, advisory group where is Wendy Paulson? Wendy, you're here somewhere. Wendy, thank you very much. <laughs> Wendy chaired our Next Century Conservation Plan group, and now she's a chair of our Next Century uh, Conservation Plan and Policy, Planning and Policy Council. So I'm very grateful to Wendy for her good work, and I know that she's been a, a, an important member of the the conservation and, and, uh, and uh, ecological community for a very long time. So thank you very much, Wendy. I appreciate it. As some of you may know, I, I grew up in Minnesota, and I spent a lot of my summers at my grandmother's cabin, about 150 miles north of the, the Twin Cities. Um, but many years uh, after coming to Chicago in, in 1965, for many years, all I knew about the forest preserves was John Stroger's annual picnic at Green Lake Woods. <laughs> so I come out of the, the political community, and, and that was a must for all of us on the south side to show up at John's picnic. But back then, I didn't appreciate that the Chicago region has some of the richest biodiversity on the planet. So you know that there are 102 counties. There we go, back again. 102 counties in the state of Illinois, and the most uh, ecologically diverse is Cook. It's the most ecologically diverse county in the state. Many of you in this room are veteran land managers, you're bird watchers and botanists, and you know all about the diversity. You know, I think, but many people think of Cook County and they think only of our neighborhoods and our skyscrapers, and they don't think of our prairies, our oak woodlands, and our wetlands. But you've made yourself walking storehouses of ecological knowledge and you're truly passionate about sharing what you know. We're grateful. Those of you who are new to this, be warned. <laughs> You'll never be able to look at a forest of buckthorn with the same sense of serenity again. <laughs> you 
We know that there are scores of world-class natural areas across the Chicago region and Cook County, and many of our preserves are in critical need of help. After decades without adequate management, they've become degraded by invasive species, disrupted natural processes, lack of fire, and other issues. The Forest Preserve's soon-to-be-released Natural and Cultural Resources Master Plan, which you can learn about today at 225, reports that 54 percent of Cook County's forest preserve lands are developed, degraded, or highly altered. That's a statistic my administration is dedicated to changing. Some of you in this room, thank you. Let me just say, you know, um, the forest preserves were uh, kind of a, a patronage backwater before I, before I came here. And I was determined not only to bring new leadership with Arnold and his team, but a new commitment, a new commitment to maintaining and restoring uh, the forest preserve assets. So we've worked hard at that. Some of you have, have, have been aware of our work, and I am grateful for the good work that you've done, which kick-started the habitat restoration movement in Chicago 40 years ago and made us a leader. I'm sorry about the microphone. It's kind of annoying to me. I don't know how you feel about it. Um, it's made us a leader. Your good work has made us a leader in, in stewardship of natural uh, areas and continues to help us move forward. Can we get some help with the microphone? or is it? She went back to fix it. OK, good. Pardon me? All right, good. I'll just scream. We're encouraging, we're encouraging everyone to join our Centennial Volunteers Initiative to help remove buckthorn, honeysuckle, and garlic must, mustard, to pick up trash or to collect and spread native seeds. And if you've come from further away, from our collar counties, we are grateful for your presence today and for the good work you do in those districts, not to mention the state and federal lands which also need your help. Protecting our ecosystems is the first goal of the Next Century Conservation Plan an ambitious framework that I said I commissioned to lead the forest preserves into our second century. The plan calls for us to restore 30,000 acres in the next 25 years. Now remember, we're starting with a core of 69,000, so it's almost half of our acreage. And of course, we want to expand our acreage to 90,000. We've allocated $6 million, both this year and last year, to do this restoration work on a larger scale, to better address our critical management objectives, such as prescribed burning, wildlife management, shoreline restoration, and to support our proven conservation internship programs. We've gotten a lot of kids from all across the county into our forest preserves as a result of these internships. They've been a great boon. But we can't do it without you, and we need a new generation of conservation leaders. OK, so I'm going to confess a little bit here. Whenever I walk into a room, I try to look at the gender balance. Are there, is it all men? Is there, so there are at least a few women in the room. Um, and the racial balance. So if you look at this audience, we have some real challenges. Half of the population of Cook County is black and brown. It's about 24% African American, about 24% Latino. But half of this audience is not black and brown. And speaking of future leaders, if this is the demographic in our county, we need to try to engage some of those young people, black and brown young people, who are committed to this as much as our old line conservationists and ecologists, OK? <laughs> And please understand, I'm not knocking this audience. I'm just saying we've got to figure out how to draw more people in for the future of our forest preserves district, not, here, not just here in Cook, uh, but across the region, and our natural lands across the state and the country. That's really important. When the forest preserves are threatened, when restoration efforts are challenged, when resources are dwindling, 
Our future administrations must stay the course, and we'll need people who know the preserves to stand up for them. So I hope that you get out in the preserves. I go walking. I know some of you go birding, canoeing, fishing, picnicking. And of course, I'm grateful to all of you who volunteer. This summer, I hope you'll join us for family camping. We've got five new overnight campgrounds, and we're going to reintroduce family camping for the first time in more than half a century. So wild spaces are critical to the future of our region. You know that. We have to share that with everybody we know. And again, I want to thank you for all your help and good work. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And I apologize, not that I had anything to do with it for the poor speaker, <laughs> for the poor microphone. But we got the message loud and clear, right? Everybody heard it. Great. Um, <clears throat> we're trying to fix it. Now, um, we move on to the next part of our presentation today. Bill Kleiman is the project director for the Nature Conservancy's Natusa Grasslands in North Central Illinois. Bill has directed all aspects of this major initiative since 1993. Many of us have been inspired by that model of ecological restoration and community. Bill is also an organizer of the Illinois Prescribed Fire Council and the U.S. Grassland Restoration Network. I bet maybe you didn't know there were such things out there like that. Um, but don't let this hu uh, humility fool you. It is indeed a great honor that we welcome a keynote speaker, Bill Kleiman of Natusa Grassland. I think I hear the bison grunting and the chains clanking. <laughs> Bill? The development of grasslands. Uh, fires have been Humans have been lighting fires on our landscapes uh, for thousands of years, and before humans, and before mammals, and before dinosaurs, there were fires on the planet Earth because all you need is oxygen, vegetation, and a spark. Likewise, our grasslands uh, have had grazers on them for a very long time. Uh, okay, so a few details on that. <laughs> Think of a long period, uh, glaciers advancing and retreating, our Midwest grasslands advancing south and returning back north to the dance of the ice sheets. I wouldn't have remembered that without my notes. Uh, this long ebb and flow of grassland going back and forth. So grasslands have been here a very long time. In the last uh, thousand years, elk and white-tailed deer have been more common than bison grazing east of the Mississippi River. But just think in the long run, bison have been here for a very long time and they've been grazing our grasslands. Uh, as Sanderson and colleagues put it, bison wallowed, rubbed, pounded, and grazed the prairie into heterogeneous ecological habitats. I wouldn't have remembered that without me. <laughs> they converted vegetation into protein biomass for predators, including people, and they shaped the way fire, soils, energy uh, moved across the landscape. So here's bison latifrons. Uh, bison latifrons is a huge animal that was here on the planet from 240,000 years ago up until about 20,000 years ago. This critter was eight foot high at the shoulder. It weighed up to 4,400 pounds, much bigger than the current bison. And the horns on that thing were wider than my arms are right now. So grazing for a long time, this artist's rendering uh, is showing bison uh, latifrons in the Pleistocene. Um, and there were other wonderful creatures back then, um, like the dire wolves, giant sloths, American cheetah, 14 species of pronghorn, peccaries, llamas, stagnant, shrub ox. 
After Bison, Land of Franz meets the scene, uh, Bison Antiquis is next. This is a direct ancestor of our current bison. It's 30% bigger. Uh, its time period was 18,000 years ago up until about 10,000 years ago, which makes you think that maybe it was hunted to extinction by humans. <laughs> our current bison's population numbers are have varied over time, but they're estimated in the tens of millions uh, by settlers in the 1800s. So humans have a long history with bison. And here, over, this is a painting over in Europe of the Lascaux Cave. started about 2,000 years ago. Uh, and you can see a bison there I circle for you, and a person on horse, horse being introduced by the Spanish in the 1600s. So the, the early teamwork and planning, bison were sometimes stampeded down slopes where the snow was deeper at the base of the hill, and if you could flounder the animals in the deep snow, you could then go out and spear them. Or you could work with your tribe and Stampede a herd over a cliff. The horse introduced by the Spanish in the 1600s changed bison hunting for the Native American tribes. Here's a George Kaplan painting from 1844 of an Iowa medicine man, Sinantia. Also George Kaplan, 1844, head chief of the Iowa's White Cloud. So bison were driven west of the Mississippi by the 1830s. The 1870s and early 1880s would decimate the American bison. There was no protection for bison or any other animal at that time. Teams of hunters and bison skinners could harvest on the bison they wanted, here on all the bison they wanted. Here we see 40,000 hides a month's kill piled on a landing on the Missouri River. An 1872 bison kill, hunting teams Hunting teams had the rifle, they had horses, they had wagons, they had trains, they had steamboats. Uh, bison weren't going to stand a chance. William Tecumseh Sherman, during the Civil War, learned a lesson that if you uh, take a, your army through the, your enemy's territory and eat all their food stocks, you will win. The food stocks, bison, were the food stocks from the Plains Indians. From 1869 to 1883, Sherman is the commanding general of the United States Army. Philip, general Philip Sheridan served with Sherman in the Civil War, and after the Civil War, ran the Department of the Missouri River during the same time period. A quote from Sheridan about the bison hunters. These men have done more in the last two years to settle the vexed Indian question than the entire regular army has done in the last 30 years. Now, later in his career, to his credit, Sheridan worked to expand the Yellowstone National Park and give military protection to his elk and buffalo. Columbus Delano was our Secretary of the Interior during this time period. Quick quote, I would not seriously regret the total disappearance of buffalo from our western prairies. With the bison gone, their skulls were collected off the prairies to ship to the east coast for grinding into fertilizer. So with government support for the extermination of the species, no hunting regulations, and an increasing number of settlers entering the Great Plains, bison numbers were reduced to less than 1,000 by about 1890, from tens of millions to around 1,000. The last bison was, was seen in Illinois in 1837 in Troy Grove. Like the near extinction of bison, habitats in our home state were converted to crops diminished the tiny islands. But not all was lost. In restoration and care, the remaining habitats are left to good people who love what they see and put their souls into their work. At West Chicago Prairie, Rob Kaiser on the left, and President Steve Sentoff, Malcolm Boyle, and Scott Enzi give great care to our natural heritage. Habitat 230, comprised of um, 
the next generation of younger folks. And then John and Jane Bell Band, some of my favorite folks. Long time stewards. Long time stewards, Forest Preserves of Cook County. Um, I remember I took my first sedge class with these two. It was a lot of fun in their kitchen. And then here we got Poplar Creek Prairie Stewards. They've been working hard for decades. I see uh, Rick McCandless there and Steve Flux. <coughs> Seeing the work that is to be done, who can help wanting to be the one to do it? Doesn't it often feel like that, particularly with stewardship? At the Chusa Grasslands, the Nature Conservancy has been persistent in getting good work done. We're two hours west of Chicago, near the Rock River. This is one of our curry plantings. We're trying to produce the best curry plantings we can. This photo shows an upland prairie by volunteer steward Jay Stacy. In the photo is the yellow wood bedding. Two species of pussy toes, two upland sedges, golden alexander, alum root, and other nice plants that you usually don't expect to see in a prairie planting. We also manage a lot of woodlands. Our old woodlands have had fires at least every other year, so to slowly open them up to the sunlight that will support the start of new oak trees and support a lush understory of woodland grasses, sedges, and forage. Here's a prairie planting done by uh, Bernie and Jay. Bernie Bookholz, right over there. Bernie. This really is a beautiful sight to see in June. Look at all those blue flowers running off into the distance. So we're, we're creating habitats. We have uh, lots of diversity of critters, like the next few slides. So like a lot of you, we do brush clearing too. Um, and in this case, we have a 30-acre sedge meadow uh, that was completely, well, not always encroached everywhere. Some were good than others, but quite encroached by American elm. Uh, so three elm, so we took this machine and we cleared it in 30 days. And uh, made quick work of it. And 10 years later, with fires annually or every other year, the sedge meadow is nice and diverse. Background of that fire adapted old woodland, which has also been receiving a lot of fire. I'm going to talk about bison in a minute. But it's coming. Um, our summers are fun times marching, marching around with others, marching around with others, killing <laughs> weeds. We can cover huge areas by spreading out in formations like this. We also do seed picking. Uh, we push seed picking from June until November. Our volunteers lead the way in finding the species and picking a huge diversity. And we pick over 5,000 pounds of seed by hand. We use it for our restoration work you know, from over 200 species. And fire, we do a lot of fire in the Chusa grasslands. Um, we, uh, we work together as a team, we train together as a team. Um, we like to prepare good fire breaks the one you see here. And then we do live fire exercises for uh, training. And then we go get the job done. So creating habitat for cool critters. And it takes a community of people. And uh, people are mostly volunteers, Cody and I, and some of our seasonal hires. And this year we've hired some people for fence building. A wonderful community of folks. So back to where I left off the bison near their native. The species was re was rescued, and this is how. William Temple Hornaday was a gift of taxidermist who in 1882 was the chief taxidermist at the Smithsonian National Museum. Uh, he traveled to Montana in 1886 to collect specimens of bison for taxidermy. He was asking people before he went what they were seeing for the herds. People were not giving good reports. 
what it's seen as an endless set of uh, populations of animals uh, were being reduced drastically. Born today goes out to Montana. He saw a few hundred bison in Montana, I think, and he harvested 25. <laughs> Taxidermist, that's what they do. <laughs> would return back east and spend the next few decades working to save the American bison from extinction. In 1886, he published a book, The Extermination of the American Bison. A census of 1889 found less than a thousand bison scattered in various places, including the newly formed National, uh, Yellowstone National Park. In 1894, Grover Cleveland signs the first wildlife species protection for the American bison. In 1896, the last unprotected bison were hunted, which happened to be in Colorado. The only animals left were on the protected ground of Yellowstone National Park and in private herds. And the Yellowstone National Park had a significant amount of poaching going on. By 1903, Hornaday was directed to the Bronx Zoo in New York City. He imported 40 live bison to the Bronx Zoo's 10 acres. Those ended up being important advice. Harold Baines, at this time, was a writer and wrote 40 articles for magazines and newspapers to save bison. In 1905, Harold Baines, Hornaday, and President Theodore Roosevelt formed the American Bison Society. In 1905, the Wichita Preserve was formed. And 15 bison were moved from the Bronx Zoo. This and Yellowstone were two protected herds. Yep. So Teddy, uh, let's see, Teddy Roosevelt, he gave a speech in Chicago, you know, I think it was in 1912. Someone shot him in the chest. He had a speech like, I got it, like here, and it went through the speech and it saved his life. And he went on to give the speech, being the stubborn man he was. He also, uh, he also would throw the pages off like this. Each one had a hole in it, and everybody was collecting them from the stage. There's no weapons allowed in here, right? So, okay, here we are in fall of 1913. Bronx Zoo bison are loaded onto two boxcars in New York, and they're headed to Wing Cave National Bison Range. They get to Hot Springs, South Dakota. They unload the animals onto anybody who was willing to give them a short ride, several miles actually, to Wind Cave National Park. So there they are, you see them, they're in the boxes there. This is 1913. Those animals ended up at Wind Cave National Park, and that's how that herd got started. And those are the animals that we end up having at the Chusa Grasslands. By 1919, there are nine herds established with help from the American Bison Society. So of the current, uh, roughly 430 bison today, most of those are in for production herds for meat. Uh, only about 30,000 are conservation herds that are there just for that species. So early on, some bison were crossbred with domestic cattle. Most bison have small amounts of domestic cattle in their genome, some more, some less. A few herds have no or almost no domestic cattle, including wind cave. National Park. So the Wind Cave National Park is regarded for its unique genetics, high diversity, no cattle and regression. Conservation goals for bison are to increase the size of, the, of these herds uh, with unique genetic diversity, increase their numbers. Since Wind Cave National Park has limited pasture acreage, the number of animals they can have at maximum is only several hundred. Uh, conservationists suggest 1,100 as a minimum population for uh, that herd. So several TNC preserves located in South Dakota, Iowa, Missouri, Kansas, and now Illinois are hosting only wind cave lineage animals. The trading animals between preserves will increase the effective herd size to over 1,100. We want to leave these bison as wild as possible, handling them minimally, not feeding them, letting them enjoy our long Illinois winters. Let the bulls get old and ornery and tussle with each other. In short, let evolution continue as much as we can. The Chusa's bison are the first conservation herd east of the Mississippi. To bring them to the Chusa, we started four years ago by writing a plan 
getting approvals, and visiting lots of sites. <laughs> we have attended a dozen roundups. Bison managers like Bob Hamilton were generous with their time and critical to our success. Uh, at the Tallgrass Preserve, they can work a bison in the chute in 35 seconds. Let's see. There was a little bit of sound to this, but maybe I'll just make clanking sounds, <laughs> a little grunting, uh, the computer, uh, the person there at the computer saying the wait, and Bob's pulling off jokes as he always does. Um, he's getting a, a tag to clip onto the ear of this bison. Uh, the other guy's got his hands over the eyes, so kind of distract the bison for a minute there. Bob comes back, oh, I survived that one, grabs the wand. <laughs> wants for eating uh, buried microchips. So 35 seconds, they were able to work that animal. It's pretty impressive. And since they have 2,000 animals, they need to do that. Uh, we brought volunteers to these uh, roundups. This one, here's David Craig's working the uh, alley just before at the same roundup. And there's bison below in there. More clanking sounds, bison grunting. <laughs> John Hannigan behind them. See Cody over there. It's quite a sight. All right, Cross Ranch. Eric Rosenquist at Cross Ranch. He has neighbors come out to help him uh, get the bison into the crowd. There were at least a dozen dead. Uh, we uh, worked. Uh, we interacted with Temple Brandon. Uh, she made Temple made Time Magazine's list of the hundred most influential people in the world. Brandon works with livestock slaughterhouses to uh, evaluate and improve conditions for the animals. She is autistic and has a unique skill at being able to feel what livestock want to do in a corral. She also speaks at a lot about autism conferences. Some of her tenants on livestock corrals are in our design. So here's the here's the crowd. My pointer works uh, in the trap pasture. Animals, if you can get them, you, you can push them in or entice them in to come into the crowd. If you walk behind them, you can get the animals to move in. And then these, these zigzags, this is a Temple Brandon thing, that zigzag there. If you get them in the back here, then what you do is this guy closes the gate that they came in on, and then you take the animals, come back, and the gate's closed. And then they do some more zigzags. They like that. And they end up over here at this thing, a very expensive... Uh, it's a Berlinic cube and it kind of works with the bison. They go different ways, round and round. Finally, they go in the squeeze chute. The vet works on them, and then when the vet's done doing their work, the animals can come down the alley. They can be released, back out, not just be seen again for a year, or they can go into different holding pens and go to different preserves, or they could be sold. They could be sold. I mean. So here's uh, John Hennigan. Where's Hennigan? He's out there. There he is. John. John's building our uh, data shed. Data shed is for a person to uh, sit out of the weather and take the data and also hold, holds the, uh, the noisy hydraulic pumps in a special acoustic closet that John built. There's that data shed. There's the squeeze chute. Uh, here's a little video clip. Who needs audio on this? Come on. The audio never did work for the videos. Well, this one you would have just heard the hydraulic pump making a lot of noise. There's the vet filling up his medicines, various antibiotics. The tuberculin is for a tuberculosis test. Um, then the, uh, the animal comes in and squeeze shoot. The vet, who's completely calm and used to working in crazy situations, checks the ear to see if it has a tag on there. He sees the tag. That means it was given brucellosis, gives it a shot, the animal likes that shot. <laughs> there's a Jeff Walk, he's holding the tail up, and the vet is finding the only place on a bison with no fur. He's injecting a little bit of tuberculosis test in there. Then these hairs, these hairs go in the little envelope, Jeff pulls the hairs out and the follicles have mitochondrial DNA. We send those to a lab, the lab sends back the data to us six months later, three months later in this case, 
Now watch this one. It's going down, it goes into the pen, and then there's an hydraulic gate. Instead of a human being there, you bump them in like that. <laughs> so we just got our data back two days ago from the hair tail clippings, and our herd has a very high diversity uh, of the alleles, so high genetic diversity, more than the Yellowstone National Park herd is the Juice Grasslands herd. Scientist in, uh, for Nature Conservancy in Illinois, uh, Jeff ramped up our bison science. We have 24 ecologists signed up for studies in 2015, and we've been working at it the last few years. Uh, we're studying all sorts of things. We're looking at long-term changes in vegetation, snakes, turtles, birds, small mammals, soils, stream hydrology, native bees, and beetles. <laughs> no mouse was harmed in this. In this <laughs> So here we are at Broken Cattle Grass, and our first, I'll show you some of the, these little video clips from Broken Cattle, because this is where we got our first animal, so we'll, we'll take you through the roundup. Um, Scott Hooks there on the quad. So we're running the bison towards the corral. Here the ant from the end. Sound of thundering hooves. <laughs> then on, on the video, I know Cody's going, Tate, go get him, go get him, Tate. <laughs> the beep is running through the crowd. It's kind of funny to see that in there, too. All right, then the next thing to do. the animals. You hide below so you don't scare them and reach over and grab that rope. Go hard. So the bison end up being loaded into this semi-trailer. They go from Iowa, near Sioux City, all the way to the Juicy Grasslands, arriving late at night. Uh, they tired. The semi backs up to the crowd. Uh, we also had a big truck and trailer with two bulls on board. It backs up to the corral. This little video clip shows uh, the bison being unloaded. These are the bulls backing up the trailer. And if a bull is mad at you, you know, they paw the ground and their tail straight up. This one had both characteristics. <laughs> So the conservation herd will eventually be 100 animals on 1,500 acres. Right now they're on that north bison unit you see here. We're right now building the south bison unit. We have six miles of fence to build. So before we build the fence, we have to remove six miles of old fence. And remove a lot of brush trees, etc. Communicate with neighbors, come up with agreements, these kind of fun things. 
So there's too many to thank, really. So I just I'm gonna I'm just gonna close with a few photos of people.